Hi. Hello. Hi, Monica. Hi, Naomi. Hi, everyone. Hi. <clears throat> Naomi, do you want to MC this as well? <laughs> Take us off. I was uh, sure I can. I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess what we're going to do is um, firstly wait for Jenny to get here. Um, but the other thing that we'll do is we're, we're going to all talk um, and then we'll have a larger space at the end for questions. So I'll begin um, by contextualising some of... Um, well, contextualising our panel in the uh, context of COVID, then I'll talk a bit about ASMR. I'll hand over to Alexia and Monica to talk about um, digital drugs. And then we'll wrap it up by um, letting Jenny talk us through um, the theory around the affordances of digital pleasures. Hi, Jenny. <laughs> uh, so that's going to be the general structure for today. Um, what I am going to do is start sharing um, my screen with you. So we're going to try and go easy on the, um, <laughs> on the slides because they're not the most engaging thing to look at on the Zoom screen. I always kind of feel like I'd prefer to watch a person talking than just to stare at a blank, you know, slide in the context of Zoom. So that's my reminder to be here today. Um, <laughs> all right, so I am screen sharing. So um, the title of our panel today, I'm going to start right on time. People can trickle in and kind of catch up um, with the conversation as we go. Just a quick note that Alexia is moderating the questions in the chat. So if you have a question, drop it in there. Um, we might have time to address a couple of them while we're talking, but like I said, we're gonna try and save it so we can have a really lovely group conversation at the end. So uh, these are our Twitter handles if you wanna tweet us. Um, or tweet about the panel. Um, we, uh, we've been working in this space together since Taza two years ago now, <laughs> which seems like both a very long time and a very short time. So I'm gonna kick us off by contextualizing um, the panel. So what we see uh, at the moment is, I think neoliberalized practices of wellness being further heightened in the pandemic context, right? So we have always had this individualized, neoliberalized focus on the individual as responsible for their own wellness and well-being. And I think in the pandemic, that has become even more pronounced. So um, there is uh, research that highlights the way in which the emphasis on well-being is actively produced by the choosing consumer, which I think is a really important point to hold on to here. There's also been a concurrent rise in a therapeutic culture being integrated into daily life, where we see our workplace problems and our work-related distress as being medical or personal issues. So as a result, we see workplaces encouraging us to spend our recreational time or our pleasure time in a manner that will help us recover from what I would broadly call the trauma of modern work or the trauma of modern overwork, as it were, particularly uh, pronounced in the pandemic context where all of the responsibilities and juggling that comes alongside modern work is um, further intensified and condensed into the home space. So stress and poor health then is not understood as a result of working conditions, but our failure to behave correctly. 
So we know all this, we've known all of this for a while now. So how does it relate to the pandemic? What I wanna do is firstly outline what I think is a significant shift in language that we're seeing. So we're moving from well-being to wellness practices. So when we change the language in that way, what we are doing is erasing the subject. We're erasing the actual being who is participating in these wellness practices. So we have a shift onto practices, not persons. So we find ourselves not really asking what would really help my employee, but instigating a series of conditions that are still self-responsibility by any other name. So we find resilience in the face of austerity and worsening inequality being pushed as a solution to these problems. And it ignores the material conditions that shape an unequal society. It achieves this by instrumentalizing pleasure practices, rendering them rational, predictable, and focused on assuring productivity, which means conversely that they are often no longer pleasurable to us. So we get told that we need to be positive, we need to practice gratitude, we need to participate in our workplace funded lunchtime Zoom yoga classes. And this discourse has been uh, very much promoted, not only by workplaces, so my workplace sends a mildly obnoxious email every Wednesday called Wellness Wednesdays, but we also see this discourse echoed in efficient in official government communications. So on the DHHS website, which is the Victorian Department of Health and Human Services, they listed some inspiring wellbeing initiatives. So a wellbeing bingo game, <laughs> where children tick off bingo boxes by completing healthy activities, such as random acts of kindness, a backyard obstacle course, and taking time out to listen to music. They also included something called Squat a Clock as inspiring. Um, and it was very much, uh, I'll just read it to you. I'm not going to describe it. My description cannot capture the full effect. So Squat a Clock is a daily squat challenge to get children and families moving more. Um, and you get points for who does the most squats, I guess. So these are these are the practices that are being sold to us as uh, ameliorative of distress in the pandemic and as enjoyable. They're presented as something fun and pleasurable to do. But I don't know about you, but when I'm told to go out and have fun, I immediately want to have no fun at all uh, because <laughs> it instrumentalizes something that is personal and embodied and kind of ephemeral into a ticker box checklist that is not done for itself, for its own pleasure, for its own enjoyment, but rather in service of an economic end. To that end, wellness also incorporates this nebulous notion of self-care, which has become an increasingly consumerist practice. So I'm reminded of Donna from Parks and Rec, treat yourself, but um, I didn't do it with as much attitude, but who can? Um, but for Donna, this is a once a year activity, right? So this is her one day a year where she gets to experience the pleasure of saying yes to what she wants. Whereas we are encouraged to engage in consumerist self-care practices as a part of our daily routine. So in the in the pandemic, we're being told to engage in self-care, in pleasurable activities, not because they will make us feel good, but because they will make the unimaginable copable, that they will allow us to continue to be productive, even in the face of a once in a lifetime worldwide catastrophe. And I think there is something 
uh, a little bit shocking about that when you unpack it and put it in such blunt terms. And not only does it highlight the ways in which we might be alienated from our own labor in contemporary workplaces, but the ways in which contemporary workplaces are starting to alienate us from the sources of our own pleasure. So how do we experience pleasure in a pandemic? Well, one of the ways in which I'd like to start us thinking outside the box is by looking at the topic of ASMR. So you might have heard about ASMR. It is um, essentially sound or whisper videos that induce a tingling embodied physiological response, a feeling of relaxed euphoria. They are sounds that feel good on their most simple level. And I think one of the ways in which ASMR is so intriguing is because it is a mediated screen-based pleasure that is uniquely accessible in pandemic times. It allows us to experience an ethic of care and at times non-sexual intimacy. But what is most intriguing about ASMR, I think, is that it is fundamentally anti-capitalist. It is an accident of senses and bodies and technologies. It is free. Um, it is, in the truest sense, the pleasure of doing nothing. You sit there, you receive the sounds, and you feel good. There is no labour on the part of the participant to experience the pleasure through the digitally mediated context. All you have to do is press play on the video and allow yourself to be soothed and relaxed and pleased in a fundamental sense. So I think one of the ways in which we can think about digital experiences in the pandemic and the experience of pleasure through the screen is thinking about what already existed, what was unique about it, and how can we afford more of the experiences that curate pleasure for pleasure's sake uh, in the context of the pandemic and that are not hyper-rationalized into this neoliberalized mode of productivity. Okay, having said that, I'm now going to hand over to Alexia and Monica, who will take us through another alternative, which is drug use and digital dosing. I think I'm going to start. Is that right, Alexia? <laughs> yes. yes, thanks, Monica. Yep. Okay. So thank you so much for the opportunity to be part of this panel as well and for organising it all, uh, Nomi and Alexia. Uh, and Nomi, I loved hearing what you've just said there. Uh, thinking <laughs> the squat o'clock, I'm going to have a look at that later um, as well. Uh, yeah, so... Moving on from this discussion of ASMR and digitally mediated pleasure, I was going to sort of step back and talk about the pleasures that, um, or how pleasure is understood in the drug use space, uh, the consuming of psychoactive drugs, non-digitally, non I guess. Uh, and, and then I guess just briefly look at the intersections between digital and network technology and drug use leading on to Alexia who will talk us through uh, digital dosing or digital drugs. So, uh, yes, yeah, so in terms of the uh, recreational drug use, pleasure, well-being, and it, it interconnects a bit with what Naomi just said there, I think we can fairly clearly say that for many decades, the dominant paradigm through which illegal drug use is understood is a pathology model, a deficit model, which positions drug use as inherently negative, as destructive to health and happiness, and certainly destructive to well-being, and as reflecting a deficit in personality or social position, etc. So Within this pathology model, which essentially underpins our international and country level drug laws and their enforcement, there's no space for the existence of a non-problematic, non-medical drug use practice. That the ideal society would be drug free, uh, given that non-medical drug use is assumed to indicate pathology. So 
naturally there are many critiques of this model, uh, classic critiques including Norman Zimberg uh, from you know, four decades ago now, and, and we have some incredible critical scholars in Australia, uh, David Moore, Suzanne Fraser, Cameron Duff, etc. In, in, in the broader discipline that have critiqued this. And there's three crucial concepts that have been argued to be absent from the pathology model, agency of the subject, pleasure, and context. And given the time we have today, and one could write a thesis about the whole topic, I'll just look at pleasure really briefly. Uh, and so I guess for, you know, for the pathology model to work, it needs to ignore pleasure and it, and it does that. So what we know of course, is that pleasure is a basic motivation for psychoactive drug use. And when we ask people why they drink alcohol or use drugs, the number of things are said, but you know, to enjoy the feeling, uh, to do what you described there, Naomi, to, to, you know, and for some people, you know, it helps them to do things like helps you to dance or it helps you to do this and that. But for some people, just to sit back, to take a substance, to feel how it feels, that is a, a core motivation for folks who enjoy using psychoactive substances. Um, and so moving on from that, there's been a number of alternative paradigms for understanding drug use that have come out. And one of them of interest is the harm reduction model. And then another is the consumerism model, which, you know, uh, draws, both of them draw much from neoliberalism as well, uh, uh, Naomi. So, you know, thinking through the lens of harm reduction, rather than aiming for prevention or elimination of drug use, these policies should aim to reduce harms without necessarily reducing use. And so it it makes it possible for there to be a non-medical psychoactive drug use that is potentially lower risk uh, than otherwise. So the way that, I mean, it's a huge topic, I can't cover it in much depth here, but the way that pleasure is conceptualized through harm reduction varies a lot across the ways that harm reduction is understood, but it is certainly acknowledged as a reason for drug use and accepted as a reason for drug use in that harm reduction model. Uh, and you know, it's an acknowledgement in that model that some patterns of drug use may be safer and that it is possible to use drugs to obtain pleasure while also reducing risks. So the other model to consider uh, is the consumerism model. And in this model, uh, drugs are thought of more as commodities, so simply as products which are consumed to induce desired states of consciousness, one of which could just simply be pleasure, and there are many other states. So thinking of it this way, it allows us to consider people who use drugs to be just conforming to the norms of market-driven culture, rather than pursuing a deviant or, or aberrant activity. And some of you may be familiar with the theory of normalization of drug use, um, which has been around for a few decades now indeed, it draws on these ideas. Uh, and that for many people who use drugs, especially the recreational or party setting drug use, the, the activity, it's one that forms a culture of uh, work hard, play hard. But unlike what you were talking about earlier, Naomi, it's, it's not a sanctioned activity. So it's, it's sort of folks who are, you know, they're, they are, you know, they're playing that neoliberal subject in a way, but they're using a, a non-conformist method of uh, taking, taking their leisure time very seriously um, through, through drug use. So the drug use in many cases sits alongside activities that otherwise law-abiding citizens would, uh, would be doing. And this form of drug use is rendered invisible by the dominant model. It, it just can't account for it. Um, and that's where you get this strange disconnect between what's said at the policy level about drugs and what's actually going on uh, in, in the leisure settings. Now, of course, in the COVID era, uh, nightclub drug use, festival drug use, Drug use in big, huge settings with lots of people is, is not something that's been going on. And, and I won't have time to cover this now, but certainly drug use has been changing over the pandemic with uh, uh, drugs like cannabis and other, other sort of more depressant type drugs being used more often, reportedly in the home environment and with some of the uh, drugs you might expect to be used in the party setting being used a lot less often. So in terms of how uh, technologies facilitate the drug use experience, um, so this was um, now nearly nine years ago that I submitted my PhD, but it was sort of the core topic of my thesis at the time was, you know, how uh, it's essentially that, what was the interconnection between the internet, digital and network technologies and, and drug use? How was, I guess, uh, the evolving digital technologies at the time uh, affecting how drugs were used in different ways? And, and eight or nine years on, with internet time being so fast and so many things have changed, it's, it's sort of um, a different way to think about it. But essentially, uh, you know, I looked at 
uh, digital technology is being used as tools to enable people to consume and produce information about drugs. I looked at them as places where people could uh, um, share discourses and meanings, and these could be reproduced, reappropriated, negotiated. People could uh, neutralize the stigma attached to their drug use, uh, and they could form, I guess, the alternative discourses that, that um, they shared as, as community. And then I think even more so now in the intervening period, uh, that the final way of thinking about it was as an integration. So, you know, now more than ever, digital technology being so interwoven into our everyday lives that we almost, well, here we are <laughs> doing this uh, via it, uh, that it's, it's an aberration to be, um, for example, truly anonymous when using these technologies. Uh, there's this perception historically that the benefits of digital technologies for people who use drugs involve uh, anonymity, but it's sort of increasingly harder and harder to, to achieve that now. So pleasure can be discussed in these spaces and negotiated in these spaces, but only within certain parameters, especially given that we're so much more identified. It's harder to be that truly anonymous uh, a person using the internet um, who could be anyone as it perhaps was in the past. And in more recent years, uh, the dark net has emerged and, and other platforms, uh, encrypted digital, uh, sorry, encrypted messaging apps, Signal and Wicker. And, and, and so all these platforms have actually facilitated drug access and trading, uh, not just the sharing of information. So, yeah, moving on to Alexia now, you know, another way in which these technologies could facilitate drug use is by digitizing the entire experience. And, and this is um, what you're going to tell us more about now. Thank you very much, Monica. That, that was fantastic. Uh, it's always a pleasure to hear you talk. <laughs> and I'm learning as we're going. Um, so for just to pick up where Monica left off, the uh, the phenomenon that we're looking at um, for this particular discussion around digital pleasure is the the appearance of digital drugs. And so what we're really looking at here is something that is quite different as a phenomenon from every other form of drug access or discussion or negotiation. Now we're talking about drug experience being deeply interconnected with these digital te network technologies. In, in many ways, it doesn't happen without it. So we're really looking at a, a sort of like a translation of the, the experience of drug use into another sort of medium in many ways, but using everything that we already have. And I'd just like to sort of put forward um, a definition that we've been working on, but I'm not gonna really sit with that definition. However, here it is. Uh, so digital drugs are constituted by digital resonance that incorporates platforms, representations and connections, whose use and effectiveness is mediated through the digital body instrument. Now, it's that last part of the definition that really becomes important for us because it's really about centering the body in the digital. You know, so we're not talking about disembodied pleasure here. We're talking about digitally embodied pleasure now. And I really see that as a move, a uh, sort of a shift. And that's also why I think this is um, worth researching as, as a topic. And just to give you a little bit more information about what we're actually talking about here. So what we're talking about here is a sound-based experience through binaural beats. Right, so we are not talking about an illegal activity. We're not talking about uh, drug use on the streets. However, when we look into the, the news media around it and some of the early journal articles around it, there is still a moral panic that pretty much profiles the same type of panic related to drug use. And you can see that this is really about control and power and who controls other people's pleasure. So stepping back from that little rant, I almost got a bit ranty there. <laughs> uh, so what we're really talking about is binaural beats. And so binaural beats really work by playing two different sounds in, in um, your ears. 
And then that apparently creates a third tone within the body that the body resonates with. So that the body is actually the instrument. The sound that comes through isn't the thing that creates the experience. It's the merging of the two of them. And that's why we're really talking about and exploring the idea of digital resonance. So what sound producers have been doing is trying to simulate or stimulate the experience of different drugs. And so we first encountered this phenomenon through our research into crypto markets. And I was interviewing a, um, a drug user from Silk Road and that, that participant shared or pointed me to some uh, um, binaural beats on SoundCloud and um, had basically attempted to design binaural beats that simulated different forms of drug experience. And so, or stimulated different forms of drug experience. So that was really my first exposure to this phenomenon. And when we've been looking into what's actually happening, we, we really can't tell. We just can't tell whether, uh, because there's like an app called iDosa with all of the different designer drugs uh, sounds um, made in binaural beats for listeners that's had over apparently 2 million downloads according to the marketing blurb. Um, we know that there's, there is something happening out there and that people are curious. We also have seen sort of some YouTube videos where there's like re reactions, but that all happened in 2010, which also happened with a big marketing curve. So at this point in time, we don't know enough to even know how prevalent it is. And that really takes us to our next and, and sort of the next step in the, in the research that we have. And that has been that Monica is involved in the Global Drug Survey. And um, she's facilitated the opportunity for us to ask people who respond to that survey whether they use ASMR, whether they use binaural beats for state change and pleasurable experiences, whether they use CAM models, for example, and to find out if there is any use in the community going on. And that's really just gonna give us a sense about if this is all just like, you know, marketing, or if there is actually a point of traction. And I guess just to position why we think it's possible that there could be, is essentially we've just come through a COVID pivot and, and you know, Monica's really sort of highlighted how there has been changing patterns of drug use. There has been the fact that most festivals or places where people would casually encounter uh, drugs and, and party drug experiences, those are nightclubs. They then haven't been happening for a long period of time in lots of different countries and obviously more so in the US and um, in the UK, for example, right now. So we do imagine that people might be turning to these technologies in forms of isolation in order to experience pleasure. So that's pretty much it for me. Uh, Monica, did you wanna add anything about the GDS? Yeah, I mean, I think you've, covered it there um, in addition to asking whether or not they have experienced these particular technologies in the last 12 months. If they have, then they've got a few more questions about um, what they've gained from that or, or their, their reason for doing so. Uh, and also to see whether that use was sparked after or before uh, March 2020, which we define as the start of the pandemic. So we've got an opportunity there to see whether or not the pandemic has uh, resulted in, in this kind of uh, interest by people who, in this sample is people who would normally use at least one, uh, either alcohol or an illegal substance. So um, we're already sort of not looking at the total population of all people there um, and, and seeing how that articulates to their drug use as well. Thank you. So I think now it's time um, to pivot to Jenny. And you can sort of see across our discussion that we've started to bring in some conceptual toolkit to be able to talk about what we think is a slightly new phenomenon. Um, so here's Jenny to, to take it all home for us. Yeah, um, thanks so much. That was, uh, I've you know been um, talking with Alexia, Monica and Naomi about these ideas for such a long time. And every time I hear them speak about it, I'm just enthralled. Um, and I'm sort of uh, excited to, to keep doing this work. 
Um, I hope you will bear with me. I do have slides. There are three of them and they get progressively better as they go. And we spend most of the time on the third slide, which is the best one. So I'll share these with you if that's okay. Um, where is my share screen? There we go. Share. Okay. Um, okay. So, um, so my job on this panel is to is to wrap the meanings and experiences of digitally mediated embodied pleasure through, in particular, um, binaural beats or digital drugs and ASMR into a cohesive theoretical frame. And the frame that I'll rely on is technological affordances. Oh shoot. <laughs> There we go. Okay. Um, so technological affordances refer to the ways that the features of a technology, its technical specifications, affect the functions of a technology, its direct utilities, and its broader flow on social effects. Though a simple and widely used concept, its full theorization is densely packed, balancing the double and coincident factors of materiality and human agency encompassing critical assumptions about the mutual shaping relationship between technological objects and human subjects, attending to the ways values, norms, and socio-structural arrangements are built into technological systems, which then build and rebuild individual and collective worlds. I'll rely here in particular on the mechanisms and conditions framework of affordances, which I laid out in a recent book that Naomi and Alexia helped me launch here at TASA yesterday. Uh, the mechanisms and conditions framework shifts the orienting question and affordance analysis from what technologies afford to how technologies afford for whom and under what circumstances. The how of affordances or its mechanisms indicate that technologies request, demand, encourage, discourage, refuse, and allow social action. Uh, these are conditioned on individual and collective uh, and contextual variables grouped into perception, what a user knows of an object, what they understand about it, dexterity, one's capacity to operate the technology in, uh, under study, and cultural and institutional legitimacy, the social support or lack thereof for technological engagement. So how can we think about digitally mediated embodied pleasure and its relation to wellness through an affordance lens? What do these technologies request, demand, encourage, discourage, refuse, and allow for whom and under what circumstances? Or concretely, how do brushes, microphones, video infrastructures, laptops, and fingernails combine to encourage soft bodily tingles? How do earphones, aural beats, brains and eardrums converge into an altered cognitive embodied state? But moreover, what are the social conditions that can enable these technobody collaborations to thrive? And what are the social conditions under which they diminish? I'll focus here on the relationship between wellness and pleasure as they inform and affect socio-technical systems through one particular condition of affordance, cultural and institutional legitimacy, or the social circumstances surrounding socio-technical engagement. And what I'll do, and I didn't expect to do this when I started writing the paper, but it's how things went, is I'll make the case that a pleasure framing for many discourages or refuses ASMR and digital drug consumption, while a frame of well being renders consumption socially acceptable, even virtuous, requesting and encouraging the consumptive practice and resultant body, bodily experience. Wellness thus opens the door for pleasurable consumption but in doing so, reinscribes a normative politics of reason. Wellness technologies are socially acceptable, honorable, and good. Yet technologies of pleasure remain somehow shameful, hedonistic, too human, too much about the body. These meanings are not a function of the technologies themselves. They don't have to do with the technical specifications, but rather of the meanings with which these technologies are imbued. I can't help but think of the medicalization of women's sexual pleasure in the 19th century, when doctors prescribed and administered orgasms for hysterical housewives, 
and the extraordinary ordin ordinariness of this practice, of this medicalized practice, such that vibra vibrators came to be sold in the Sears and Roebuck catalog until the 1920s, when they were swiftly removed after they started appearing in pornographic films and thus stripped away of the medical, medical veneer and women stripped away of their plausible deniability that they were, in fact, buying pleasure. This is perhaps why ASMR practitioners and consumers take pains to define the practice and its technological and its technological implements as actively not sexual, as an act of self-care but not self-gratification. This framing of rational well-being renders the practice socially supported, granting it cultural legitimacy and thus allowing pleasurable consumption without the baggage of embodied joy, which would alternatively discourage consumption as frivolous, indulgent, perhaps blushworthy. In this way, digital drugs are presented as a safe and potentially acceptable option, not a supplement to mind-altering ingestible substances, but an, an but an antiseptic version, a mocktail, a socially sanctioned playground. What I'm suggesting is that these technologies, ASMR and binaural beats, are enabled by a virtuous wellness framing, and in many ways, through their juxtaposition against raw embodied pleasure. The technical elements would be the same either way, but their deployment and availability within each respective frame, rational, rational and pleasurable respectively, are radically different. What wellness encourages pleasure, uh, sorry, wellness encourages, pleasure discourages or refuses. This speaks to a broader point about affordances in practice. Technical features are not vacuous mechanical elements, but social objects that reflect, create, reproduce, and potentially disrupt normative social values. In the spirit of disruption, I'll finally suggest that binaural beats and ASMR operate as vehicles that reproduce wellness value and pleasure shame. And yet this is not inevitable and could be otherwise. These same technologies with no technical alteration could be unapologetically about pleasure. Participant, practitioners and consumers could tout the tingles, the sense of escape, the sensations of remote touch. They could shout pleasure rather than hiding it. In the, in the near term, this may have dampening effects, rendering the tools less accessible because less acceptable. Yet this framing may also act as an entry point for upending the shame of pleasure. If we make technologies and technologies make us, then technologies of pleasure openly consumed have the capacity to normalize pleasure as part of daily living, stripping away its shame that hides currently under the rational cover of well-being. Thanks so much. It was beautiful, Jenny. That was really, really nice. Um, wow. <laughs> so good. So good. Um, I, I loved the well-being versus shame uh, dichotomy that you brought into play. Um, and one thing I was thinking about, about the well-being and the rationalization of pleasure as making pleasurable activities acceptable is something that's commonly used in therapy. Um, so they will give you like a pleasurable activities list and it's got, you know, 300 different things on it, right? And one of which, the first one is being in nature. And um, another one further down the list is participating in war games. But, you know, different strokes for different folks, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> but what it strikes me as the list is not so much a way to reconnect with pleasure, but a way to make pleasure permissible. Like it's okay to do the things you like. It's okay to make space for things that are pleasurable to you. Um, so we have this therapeutic model and this wellness model, both rationalizing and permission giving to these pleasurable encounters, which as you so rightly point out, makes them both more accessible and kind of strips them of some of their joy at the same time um, because it, it, it cleans them up in a way. Um, and part of what makes things pleasurable is uh, that they are not necessarily sanitized and in service of something bigger than themselves. Um, 
feel free to ask questions in the chat at this point. Um, we will just keep talking amongst ourselves. But before I go on, I do want to point out that my ASMR co-author, Anne-Marie Snyder, is in the chat today. Um, <laughs> she is in California, um, and I have written all of my publications about ASMR with her. Um, it's coming close to her bedtime, so um, <laughs> I won't put her on the spot, but she can also help with ASMR questions if people have any. So I guess I just wanted to open it up to the floor and the rest of the panel as to what questions um, this provocation, this set of ideas um, opened up for you. And if there was anything else that as you were listening, you thought, oh, I really wish I could ask a question about this or I really want to add this in. Anne-Marie? I'm going to unmute myself ever so briefly. I just want to shout out and say I was really excited to hear about that history of the vibrator, just kind of like yeah. contextualizing the history of why we've kind of become just like institutionalized, institutionalized ways of how we've been disconnected from pleasure mm -hmm. and like how pleasure became not okay to like how pleasure became okay. And it's just something that is good to think about. Um, but yeah, I was excited. I was like, oh, good. Yeah, I forget about those things. And it also it fits with the history of uh, illegal drug prohibition. So back in that same era, um, I mean, all the drugs that are prohibited now were not prohibited then. And they weren't all around then, but some of them were. Mm. Um, so it, it's interesting that that does connect in terms of the timelines. Yeah, the history of the the women in the prohibition and kind of all that stuff in the United States, like we teach that in sociology here in the States a lot. And the students are always like super surprised about, wait, people like had, did meth? Like, mm. like it was <laughs> like they're like drugs were more accessible like back yeah. when? What happened? Yeah. Yeah. I wanna I think I think that's actually that's such a great point. I think often we we think of techn technologies as operating on a linear, linear trajectory, but we also think of normative values as operating on a, on a linear trajectory. And like anytime you dig into the history of anything, it's, it's never the case, right? Like it's always fractured and start and stopped and looped. And I think like this history of drugs, drugs and sex and pleasure really kind of drives home how technology and morality broadly conceived have come in this sort of um, start-stop cycle rather than a sort of linear trajectory of permissibility and progress. The other thing I also wanted to highlight is that my cat is here, but no, that's not what I wanted to say, um, <laughs> uh, is that we like to think of technology as being less than, less than real, like as mattering less than, as having a less effective pull. And I think what these digital pleasures attune us to is the potency of technology, the effective potency and the way in which pleasure um, that is mediated through screens and through objects of uh, resonant media are very much embodied and are still very powerful. Um, and it stops us, I think it points a way out of the deficit model that we often use to talk about technological experiences, um, where they are a, a pale photocopy of what we imagine real rich experiences to be. And instead it attunes us to the ways in which there are unique potent experiences happening through technology that are designed for and by those technological affordances. So we have to look at what is being facilitated and encouraged and heightened and intensified through technology instead of photocopying a real life experience into digital realms and going, well, why doesn't it feel as good? Well, you're not working with the affordances. You're fighting up against them. 
right? Because you're trying to make them do something which they could never do, which is accurately simulate real life. But they can do a bunch of other stuff that's fascinating. They can expand our senses um, and they can make us hear sounds that we would otherwise miss in everyday life. Um, so they can do other things. But when we try and make them do something that is kind of like we're kind of hacking into the system, of course, it's always going to be a deficit because it's not working with the stream of affordances, it's fighting up current against them. That's amazing. And that just made me uh, think, you know, like you said, it's, it's not like we're hacking into the system, but actually it's like we're hacking into ourselves. Mm. You know, that was just the sort of like, I heard you do that and I thought, oh, <laughs> we're, we're, we're almost reverse engineering. <laughs> I've got a I've got a question for Jenny. <laughs> um, Jenny, that was an amazing piece of, of mm -hmm. work, and uh, mm -hmm. the first time we've had the pleasure and chance to hear it. And what I really wanted, I need I needed a rewind button, so I had an opportunity to take it in a bit more. And really, I just kind of wanted to see if I could get you to to unpack a bit more the idea of consumerism and um, what we're really looking at with sort of digital drugs and, and ASMR. So that's sort of like a, an angle that I want to catch up on. Do you want to take me down that street again? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so I wasn't talking as much about like, like capitalist consumerism, but what are the conditions that enable and constrain consumption of these products? the use of these products. So one of the things I think attention that I was trying to draw out and kind of thinking about it is how a wellness framing makes them more accessible because more acceptable at the same time, but it does so by sort of politely taking away the pleasure element, right? So it's an act of self-care, but not self-gratification. Mm. Um, and so I think for, so I think that's kind of where I was going. The way that we frame these, these technical, technological objects without changing their technical elements at all can affect what they mean and how accessible they are, but also reinscribe normative values all the while. Mm -hmm. so, there's this, uh, so, it, so I think one of the things I was doing is playing with that tension or I sort of wanted to draw out was this tension um, between accessibility and acceptability. What does it mean when we make, make it acceptable and so accessible, but also what does that do to a normative politics? Mm -hmm. What I was thinking as you were saying that is when ASMR first mainstreamed, mm -hmm. every article you would find was like, oh, look at this weird fetish thing. Mm -hmm. um, and it was all, all about framing this pleasurable experience as deviant, Mm -hmm. um, as stigmatized, as somehow akin to sex work, which shouldn't be stigmatized, but you know, it, it still is. Um, and it has taken them like a concerted effort to kind of recover from that stigmatization. And part of that is due to what Amory and I have found is that they make a concerted effort to kind of tap into these wellness, well-being, uh, mindfulness even discourses where to, to kind of distance themselves from that deviantized pleasure framework that makes it more difficult for people to consume these things. Can I ask a follow-up question about that? Yes. So are there any like rogue ASMR practitioners, other producers or consumers who are like, no, this is kind of sexy. Like who, in yes, okay, so there are defectors. Well, they call it, like they call it ASMR, but I think the introduction of the sexualized element makes it something different again. Mm -hmm. So you have the sound plus the erotic, which mm -hmm. is kind of a different combination again. So they've taken, I think, the fundamental pleasure of ASMR 
um, which is the sound. Um, and the feeling, I really think is the feeling of like non-sexual intimacy and the comfort of the small domestic spaces that we inhabit. So they've taken that fundamental like pleasure and they've eroticized it. Um, which is fine, humans do that all the time. But I think it's kind of like a remix of ASMR, um, not so much ASMR itself. But the community like doesn't really talk about those people, those people, because they are seen as delegitimizing the ASMR project, which is to be mainstream, which is to get brand endorsements on your YouTube clips so you can actually make a living from what is a very intensive process to do. It takes a lot of time and effort to create an ASMR video, even though they might look like they're lo-fi. Lots and lots of planning goes into producing this pleasurable experience. I would love to follow that infighting a little, like follow that thread of, um, or of boundary, I guess of boundary, boundary negotiations would be really- yeah, we call it boundary work. Yeah, the boundary work, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's just, um, I think it's what all niche communities do is that they have to draw the line somewhere. Mm -hmm. They have to draw the parameters of their community somewhere. Otherwise, it loses its coherence as a group and is unable to speak as a group, I think, because there's too many competing voices. Henry is nodding, so that means I'm saying something that's not too far outside of like <laughs> what we mutually agree is correct. <laughs> the, um, the not safe for work stuff is like it's like its own thing, right? Yeah, kind of like because it is. I think they are getting money from patrons to that yeah. like that kind of that like segment of it. But yeah. I do think it's like I totally agree. It's like its own separate thing, mm -hmm. and it kind of yeah, it it it's emerged, but emerged as its own thing, yeah. And we do see sex workers who primarily do their sex work online taking up some of these technologies of sound um, and building it into their sex work. But I would say at that point, it doesn't become. ASMR becomes a separate social phenomenon. Like, I think the phenomena can change depending on what group is using it um, and how they're using it and what context it's being um, explored in. Um, the boundary work is always super interesting. Um, and ASMR artists, particularly women, take a lot of pains to present themselves in a way that is not sexual. So I have yet to see cleavage of any magnitude in an ASMR video. Like it's always up to the neck, sometimes a turtleneck. Um, it's very modest clothing um, and kind of has, I would say, a maternal vibe or like a friend vibe. It's like a de deliberately like, like they do everything they can to communicate that they are not doing this in a sexual way. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of deliberative self-presentation strategies and paratexts that frame the ASMR experience as non-sexual or not intentionally erotic. Can I ask another, can I ask a, another question? Yeah, <laughs> sure. Like, I mean, you've got the floor, Jenny. <laughs> yeah, you got the floor. So if anyone else wants to, um, uh, butt in or ask a question or make an observation you are more than welcome otherwise as you can see we will just keep going we'll just keep going. <laughs> by all please interrupt us <laughs> okay so while you while that percolates i have a monica alexia question um so so i'm curious about and this is actually interesting because you asked me about markets and consumption but um I'm curious about markets and consumption for digital drugs. Like to what extent is that commercialized and monetized and how, like, is, how does that work? So I'll have a starting point and then I mm -hmm. might try to segue to Monica on that one. Um, so basically it's very different or is it to, how uh, drug markets work. Mm 
right? So that's kind of the frame that I'm going to use. Mm -hmm. So where we can see how we first encountered it was through our interview work. So that came through SoundCloud and that was not monetized, right? So it was initially, my guess is sort of like that kind of tinkering experimental culture, which came uh, particularly the, the sort of, can you make this sound evoke the experience like this drug? You know, that question. So the sort of music designers and who, who may also be drug takers, um, that was their question. They were like, we got sound, we got drugs, we got experience, can we put them together? And so I think that that initial question was very much not a monetizing question, but of course, drugs and money. Hmm. <laughs> so very, while you might sort of think that it was experimental and communal and sort of sonic sharing at the time, everyone would have just gone, goodness me, if I could make a simulation of co the cocaine experience, uh, I'm just going to chuck that in an app and, and get a body of users. So all of these apps that um, offer, and I've just checked uh, iDosa today, and actually it's just, it's sort of almost rebranded from how we saw it last year. So you can't really see the drug um, option. That's in, very in interesting. Oh, I was fascinating. I'm like, ooh. And so when I heard Jenny saying, you know, the whitewash, mm. <laughs> I was just like, I've just seen it. Because the wellness we've seen whitewash. The wellness whitewash. Oh, she yeah. was here with a massive bucket. Mm. So <laughs> it's, you know, the, the veneer of that app has changed and um, uh, very quickly. And, uh, you know, this sort of the digital drugs is now just one sort of uh, euphemistic category. It's not even digital drugs. It's just some sort of euf euphemism for, you know, recreational pleasure. And uh, so those apps, you know, you pay. You pay to get the app. So if they've had 2 million downloads and the app's 8 bucks, then that's the beginning of your economy of scale, mm. uh, which is where most... Uh, designers uh, would be looking uh, and of course you know you'll have all sorts of difference just I would sort of parallel it to drug producers or music producers you know you're looking for who are you looking for audiences and those experiences that are created between the producer and the audience for example that's mutual that's a mutual space. And that's where we sort of look at that role play question um, for you, Jenny. So that's, you know, and it's, there's a whole different language around it, but we're still looking at economies of scale here mm -hmm. and, you know, economies of scale where, where, where it's, it's not, it's, it's sort of, it's not illegal. It's just another app with binaural beats. You can go to sleep to them. But as soon as we start to say this alters your state towards pleasure, that is just going to trigger uh, the question of is this a grey space that needs to be regulated? Mm -hmm. And already, um, already, you know, just that moral panic immediately from 2010 till now, any time you encounter content around it, there's moral panic. And it's binaural beats. There was so, a journal article, wasn't there? Which was, it was unbelievable, yeah. <laughs> quite, um, basically, yeah, teens will listen to this on their phones and then they'll basically go out and start taking drugs and the rest is history. So it was that was that kind of moral panic was going on. Uh, yeah, the gateway theory was invoked, that sort of thing. And look, I mean, I guess it is a question um, one could look at, especially if uh, these sorts of digital drugs start to become a th more of a thing. And that's what we just, we haven't, you know, that's the thing. We just haven't heard enough. There hasn't been media even commenting on it lately in any way such that we would think, well, okay, there is a few people out there doing this, but are those people that are doing this people that, you know, already have drug use experiences in their history mm. or not, um, you know, uh, to start to even look at those questions uh, are there any particular harms that could occur through the use of digital drugs? Do they even work? I mean, we don't know. There's just so many questions we just don't have the answers to. And, and we won't be able to find all of those things out. But 
we'll get a little bit of a lay of the land, I think, mm -hmm. with the survey. And I guess just to add to what you guys were saying before about the, um, you know, the, the asexual or non-sexual motivations of ASMR, you know, we will be asked, we would need to have a, a, an option in the survey for, you know, I'm using this thing to experience sexual pleasure. Mm -hmm. So if we do get a large proportion of people who say they use ASMR to experience sexual pleasure, then that will be, you know, super interesting, uh, in, super in, interesting. In, contra in contrast to the way that they're framing it. And, and also, I guess it goes to why they're framing it in that way, because of the acceptability, the, the you know, interacting with this wellness uh, aesthetic, which is sort of much more acceptable. Um, than, than the other aesthetic, the pure pleasure perspective. And mm -hmm. even in, you know, sort of the subjugated online communities that I looked at, the sort of underground communities, there was still um, gatekeeping around the concept of pleasure, even in those mm -hmm. communities, you know, because of the concerns about moderators and other people on these groups that, you know, they could get shut down or, you know, they can't be seen to be glorifying drug use because ultimately they have to at least have the veneer of being concerned more with reducing harm than um, allowing everyone to get high all the time. Mm. So that, that there's, even that's happening in the drugs world, uh, a parallel a bit to what you were talking about, Nomi, in the ASMR world. Mm. Kind of fascinating to me. <laughs> yeah, it is fascinating. Any, no, still no questions. We're just like, Going to keep talking amongst ourselves, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I look, all I have to say is that when I make the rest of you write up this panel as a journal article, we're going to call it, we're going we're gonna to call it the wellness whitewash, right? You know, oh. <laughs> because I think that so perfectly encapsulates the tension that we're looking at here between these wellness practices where everything has to be good for you it has to be good for you like both in a physical and mental sense but also like in a moral sense um like wellness is like morally good and pleasure is like mm. <laughs> maybe you should rein it in a bit like i think pleasure is what we associate with the illicit um as opposed to the everyday which is such a false binary um, that, <laughs> that I think when we look at these kinds of digital pleasures, we can kind of really tease it out, particularly, I mean, I come back to ASMR because that's like what I know, but you know, it, it illustrates the pleasure in the, in the mundane, which is something that we don't like often comfortably encounter because we're busy, like making healthy meals that are good for you. And that is a nourishing mental health practice. <laughs> like, yeah, of course it is, but it also is just good. It also just feels really good to eat a really good bowl of pasta. Like just feels good. Um, uh, but there's no kind of space for sort of talking about how we encounter the pleasure of the everyday. Um, because pleasure is illicit and wellness is morally good. Um, so yeah, I think there's a real interesting tension there that we can use those technologies to unpack. I'd like there's to explore, oh, sorry. sorry. There's also a lot of ASMR artists. And I think in the early days, there were like a lot of white women that yeah. were mm -hmm. like the main kind of people you were considering as like, this is like, a big ASMR artist. But now when we look at ASMR, there are so many people of color like yeah. representing, making like great channels, great content, having so many followers that it's kind of expanding mm -hmm. and kind of like the history of ASMR and kind of where it's going in the future. I kind of wonder like, where will white women, <laughs> not to privilege the white woman's experience, but just kind of like, it's shifted in a sense that it started with a lot of white women and yeah. we're going into this way more inclusive space. And what does that mean for how we talk about mm -hmm. ASMR? I think that's such an interesting point because these digital pleasure technologies, these resonant media are more democratic than other forms of production and media. So it's easier for diverse people 
uh, people from diverse backgrounds to get a foot in the door um, and to build an audience and to build that connection with their audience and to carve out some digital space in that community because the boundaries and the barriers to entry are so much lower because I could make an ASMR video on my mobile phone. It might not be as good as the big names, but a lot of people would still find it very pleasurable and enjoyable, even without all of the bells and whistle technologies. And we're living in an age where most people have this computer which can edit video, record high quality sound in their pocket. Um, so we do see these niche communities like ASMR as Anne-Marie said, becoming increasingly diverse spaces, which is interesting because what is pleasurable to white women is probably not going to be the same as what uh, creators of color um, and creators of disability and different sexualities are putting out into ASMR. Because what we find pleasurable in terms of sound, right, is very closely tied to our cultural context and our memories and our upbringing and what we find comforting. And that is not universal across race, ethnicity, sexuality, ability. I have a, can, I, can I say a thing? Yeah, <laughs> does, the, does the audience have another question? <laughs> Anybody? Don't ask questions, Jenny. It's just <laughs> <a> <laughs> what, So one thing that really strikes me is that so we've sort of come up with like wellness washing right so what we're doing is we're well mm -hmm. you know right so wellness washing makes these things accessible by making them acceptable but then i also think what we have not with these technologies but with we also have in the marketplace a pleasure washing where we make hyper acceptable things more appealing by tacking on pleasure. And so like yeah. the examples that I'm, an exa a standout example for me, which is like, I don't even know if it exists anymore, but it was really popular for, you know, like, I don't know, 10 years ago was um, uh, pole dancing exercise classes. <laughs> yeah. Right, so where you took this hyper acceptable thing, which is physical fitness and yeah. you gave it, um, a very bad, <laughs> right like you made it you you made it sassy yeah. by calling it pole dancing and yeah. and having champagne parties when women would like graduate to the next thing yeah. i have a very good friend who was very into this so um i've not tried it i should say that <laughs> just, just so you know that i'm coming from a place of la a lack of experience a secondhand experience with pole dance exercise i mean i just look at those things and i think there's no way i'm getting anywhere near that like well what is the thing the order to mean? right so like okay so experientially i think a lot of us have a lot of feelings about whether or not that is pleasurable and desirable but what it's doing is you know so on the one hand we have the wellness washing of deeply pleasurable experiences to make them acceptable enough to um, to consume. On the other hand, we have highly acceptable and, and um, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Virtuous, we have virtuous yeah. activities that are um, imbued with pleasure framing to make them more marketable. So yeah. there's this uh, interesting tension happening there in which there's um, a small spectrum of, of uh, pleasure and virtue, and they optimize when they exist together in this mm. quite, you know, sort of narrow scope. And then outside of that, on either side, they become either unappealing or too hedonistic. Mm. There's like something, that's the first time I've had this thought, so what, my articulation is rough, but that's where my head is. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, the same, it's the same problem like that we always have with the illusory normal, as you point out in your book. It's just like, it's such a narrow space mm -hmm. for things to exist in. Um, and I taught sociology of deviance this semester, mm -hmm. um, and... I think it, like at its core, the sociology of deviance is distinct from criminology, is trying to problematize the social space of normal. Hmm. What it like, what the cultural norm is. 
you know, and how it's constructed and why and where the boundaries are. And also pointing out where it shifts all the time constantly for different people at different times. So I think that's kind of what's going on there with that thought that you're having is that contextual shifting of the cultural normal and who is allowed to participate in um, these pleasurable activities when and under what circumstances. Maybe you're only allowed to participate in pole dancing classes because they're actually really hard and everyone actually knows that you're doing something virtuous anyway mm. because you're paying because you and also though because you're paying for it you're doing it generally with other middle class yes middle class heteronormative women and because it's in so it's it's constructed within a very bounded safe space yeah and so you can do it without stigma and in fact with added virtue right because now you're fit and have an edge right yeah. which is very distinct from the women who do that still very laborious physical work yeah. for Different a living. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think this, where this conversation has gone really illustrates the importance of pleasure as a sociological concept. Mm -hmm. um, and the fact that we need to bring that in and we need to bring the body in and we need to think about the way in which these, this, these things triangulate with mm -hmm. technology and how they are legitimized and delegitimized. And what are we doing with this all consuming frame of wellness where everything has to be well, you have to be well all the time. Um, mm -hmm. It's like, it's, it's, I think there's a lot going on there that speaks to the contemporary social world you know in a western context that deserves to be theorized and unpacked and deeply interrogated i agree <laughs> i think maybe that's our swan song yeah shall we shall we wrap up <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we'll just like check in with the audience again. Thank you for sticking with us. Um, if anyone has any like final points or questions that they'd like us to respond to, um, we're happy to do that. But if not, um, I'm slowly starting to cook in my spare room in the Western sun. <laughs> so I'd really like to just fan myself vigorously for a while. <laughs> uh. Well, That's thank fine. you. Yeah, and thank you so, so much. Really Thanks, everyone. It. I'll head off. <sighs> joy. <Thank you. laughs> that was awesome. Bye. <laughs> Such a joy. <laughs> <laughs>